Hi everyone, um, my name is Lara, this is Megan, and we're from the Tower Centre. And we've come all the way from Australia today to talk to you about why we don't need revenue in the token economy. And this is something that we get asked a lot, um, especially because Power Ledger was founded on a vision of creating a movement rather than a corporation. So um, we believe very strongly in this, and um, we've got a couple of slides. Um, just so there's a little bit of structure to what we're going to talk to you about today. Um, so how you arrive at blockchain? Is blockchain really the right thing for if you're building a project? Uh, why revenue isn't possible? And believe me, it took some time to convince other people we've talked to about this. Uh, but it is certainly the way of the future. Uh, what then different, uh, differentiates crypto networks? And then finally, what do revenue corporations look like in this space? So this is something that has been kind of a famous thing tossed around by mainstream media as well as the corporate world. Blockchain is the solution looking for a problem. Now, obviously, most of you here kind of have a general understanding of what blockchain is and its implications, and you probably don't believe this. But when we're talking about the origin of a company starting, it's super important that this isn't how you start. You don't start thinking, this blockchain space is really cool, like the previous speaker talked about, but rather you think about the pain points and something that makes a lot of sense. So, Rex just said, step one, start with a pain point. What's the problem that you're trying to solve? Uh, solve? And maybe blockchain isn't the right solution. Secondly, is can it be solved with a peer-to-peer -peer network? Is it better? Is it cheaper? Is it more efficient if it's peer-to-peer? -peer? And then thirdly, does that network um, need trustless, um, trustless players? So is there an issue where um, the issue of trust is really important? So this is a really cool diagram, which I'm not going to spend much time on, because I think a few people have talked to when you need a blockchain and when you don't. But if you want to look it up, the World Economic Forum, I just saw it yesterday, so it's quite recent, put out this kind of map of when you should use a blockchain. And what I like about this is there's sections that say a blockchain can't do this yet, but there's projects working on it. And so things like privacy on a blockchain, it's historically we've always said if you want privacy, don't use a blockchain. But now we're starting to get to this realization that we can do these things on a blockchain using unique technologies like ZK Snarks. So I, I really like this map, and I would recommend maybe take a photo. I'll give you a quick second. Um, looking it up if you are interested in starting a project like this and understanding better if this is the technology for your startup. So I think it's been touched on a little bit today, but basically we're going from this era of Web 2.0 where you have the Amazons, the Googles, the Ubers. Everyone loves to talk about them in a super negative light, but it had its role at the time. You needed someone that could act, could facilitate this marketplace, this intermediary. And the world of blockchain, the web 3.0 as we call it, is going from not being an intermediary. So there's actually no one in the middle. You should be able to buy and sell directly with someone in this space. So if we're talking about um, Binance, the last guy messaged, mentioned, that's actually not a great crypto model because you still have an intermediary and they're still taking fees, something that we call rent seeking. So the best model is something like AirSwap or um, EtherDelta, like something that's a decentralized exchange. And so um, basically blockchain in this model is just the line. It's just the something that enables. So blockchain is not the next internet. Uh, it's a product of the internet. And it's, not a, it's a platform to enable rather than a new platform. So forking revenue. Now this is where it gets really interesting. And so I guess for contest, a good example of um, a revenue-seeking business model that I'll touch on is CryptoKitties. So someone thinks of CryptoKitties being this amazing, the first use case of Ethereum, the first thing that drives um, network adoption. But what's interesting is CryptoKitties actually has a revenue model. So they actually take a cut on every, from every smart contract goes to their auction. Um, they, they take a cut from the developer. And so they're actually uh, revenue generating. And what this means in this space is that at any point, Someone can just copy and paste your code, right? So at any point, you can just, um, since it's all open source, especially your consensus mechanisms and your smart contracts, you can just copy and paste it. So you could have CryptoKitty for dogs, right? Or crypto dogs. Um, or, or whatever iteration you want, baseball cards on blockchain, whatever, and cut out that rent-seeking fee. So you could cut out the intermediary fee and do it the exact same. Because that's code that is already existing. There's no upfront capital to create that code. So this has already happened. It's been something that's happened historically in the, in the blockchain world that you're forking others' code and creating your own project off of it. So 
probably one of the first examples is Litecoin, which is a fork of Bitcoin, which just changed the consensus algorithm or, or the, the block times. Then um, Bitcoin Cash, the most famous one, which has been really interesting in terms of what happens when you fork your community. So you have your core developers starting to, to work on a different project and different priorities. Um, Monero was a fork of BitMonero and um, Ethereum Classic, the famous DAO hack. And so it really raises this question. If you're developing this protocol or even a DAP that operates on smart contracts that's all public, then how do you maintain your company or your corporation or your brand when anyone can just at some point fork it or copy it and then take out that fee-seeking, your rent-seeking model or your fee and then just do it better if they have more capital or with a better community or with better developers? So what we, um, what we say is that companies have business models and crypto networks have incentive models. And this is a quote that um, we both love and you probably know Chris Bernice. Okay, so what makes, what are the components that makes a crypto market or a crypto network? Um, your distribution model, so uh, something that's quite differential is if you do an ICO or an airdrop. Now, ICOs I think have kind of been painted with a bad brush recently because there's so many um, bad examples recently, but basically if someone gets a free token, which is a really good way to launch a network, do an airdrop, something that you know forks of Bitcoin Cash and um, Ethereum have done, if you do that, then there's this economic philosophy around free things versus endowments. So if you get something for free, you think of it as not being worth as much value as buying something. So it's really interesting how you launch your network, what are the distribution models, um, the network effects. So um, the previous speaker talked really well into detail of this. I'm not gonna go into too much detail, but what essentially gives the uh, early adopters a reason to wanna share it. So in the early adoption of Bitcoin, people were saying, okay, you know, I'm, I'm making money off of this. There's a really good use for it. It's secure, I don't have to, it's censorship resistant, and then they're telling their friends and then growing the network because they had an incentive to. And then utility, so what's the role of the token? Do you burn them? Do you um, need it to access the network, et cetera? And then lastly, community. And so when it's all said and done, all that really sets these projects apart is their community. So if your project has no revenue and no business model, how do I differentiate and gain adoption? How do I make people uh, take up my project or how do I measure success? So a good example of this that's really relevant right now is kind of the EOS argument. So you have Ethereum who's known as the leader of the, of the decentralized application world um, and smart contract platform. And then you have EOS coming out, which is going to do exactly that, but has this two to four billion, depending on how you value it, budget to endorse themselves, create massive funds to incentivize people to develop on it. And so it, it's really interesting. So you have this new competitive environment that has nothing to do with um, you know, what your business model it is, is, and it entirely has to do with what your community is, what incentives people have to develop on it, to, to use it, what features it has. And then the second one of them will have a superior feature. The other one can just copy it. So recently, um, uh, Hashgraph came out saying they were going to integrate the EVM. So basically, a tool that Ethereum uses and Ethereum developers know, they said they're going to port onto theirs so that they can steal their developer community. And so this is kind of a whole new world that you don't see in, a, in the traditional Web 2.0 world. So key differentiators at the protocol level, obviously community, community is relevant in all of them. As we've seen in crypto, these are like tribes. People are tribal about what their crypto community is. Um, core developer talent, I mean, this is a big one. EOS was trying to, to poach Ethereum developers to de develop on their network so that they have better features faster. Um, they can try and achieve similar things in security. Um, dedicated users, so if maybe a bank is using Ethereum right now internally and they switch to EOS, this is something that is really important that EOS gets that coverage and that's what makes up their differential. And then dApps built on top of it. So, I mean, no one can touch Ethereum or even come close right now to that. But at the dApp level, so you're talking like, something built on Ethereum, either with smart contracts or they're using it um, like a token incentive model on top of Ethereum. Um, it's all about the community, their utility token model, which the last speaker talked to you really well, like the Binance burn model, um, and your go-to-market strategy. And this is something that is really interesting, how many people you get your token in the hands of and how fast that they're actually using it. And then lastly, the, the, they're your dedicated users. So this is kind of wrapping up here, so what would a corporation look like in this space? So obviously, you know, people can't monetize their open source protocol because the second that they do that, someone else will just take out that fee, 
component and then do the same thing. But what you are seeing is these service or consulting companies that a great example is JP Morgan. And we had this discussion earlier. Why would a bank want to give up their IP? Why would they create something that they don't own? It's open source. And a really good example of this is Quorum, which JP Morgan developed. And the reason they did it was because they developed, they spent all this time putting some development into it, but they charged out the fee to integrate it to these businesses. So when they went to a business that was seeking to use Quorum, they would essentially pay for the consulting and service fees. And you see the same thing with IBM. They're doing that around Hyperledger, Ethereum projects. And then um, obviously Consensus is a great example of this, of offering consulting services and integration services to Ethereum um, and, and monetizing it and having revenue and having a corporation. And then lastly, my least favorite example of all, um, <laughs> there's the Ripple model, which is that you actually sell your software because you don't open source all of it. But then I guess the part I'm more referring to is that they charge an integration fee. So if a bank wants to use Ripple, they, they pay Ripple for the integration into their existing systems. And yeah, so that's basically all of it. Um, we tried to speed through it really quickly because you guys have had a long day. But all in all, the gist is that in the, in the decentralized world of open source projects, we're going to see some really different models of, cooper of competition, cooperation, and the services model. And if you guys have any questions, let us know. <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry.